All right. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Around the Horns. I'm Aaron. I am back with my co-host, Zach. Zach, it's been a few weeks since we've been, uh, you know, on the old Zoom talking some baseball. We haven't been watching much college baseball. There's been none on since Ole Miss um, beat Oklahoma to win the title. What has been uh, filling your void as far as watching on TV? You got a new hobby, even, you know, binging some binging some new shows. What's been going on with you? Yeah, so, you know, I got I literally got off the plane and like got to a barrage of text messages about the coaching changes at Texas, yep. which led to further coaching changes and who's going, who's staying. Um, so that that took definitely took up a couple of weeks of time of figuring out what the staff's going to look like, because it's a it's basically a brand new staff. Um, and then, you know, a lot of recruiting has gone on and non recruiting and transfers incoming transfers leaving so that's taken up some time but uh i did spend the last week at the coast fishing so that was nice to get down there and, and catch some redfish and trout and flounder so yeah good times there you go there you go i like it uh yeah so we are back today to talk about the mlb draft mostly the mlb draft uh came and went last week we saw eight players get drafted off of the texas longhorn so we're gonna Shout out all of those guys. Talk about that a little bit. Um, we're also going to talk about some of the transfer portal additions that Texas has gotten that will help out the 2023 team. We will take a look at um, just some overall change in the Big 12. A lot of teams are losing a lot of players. And then um, anything you think we should have covered and or anything that we did not cover that you think we probably should have. Uh, that is because we did not do that because next week we will be having another episode with some special guests. So any questions you have for us will likely be answered in that episode, but yeah, man, I mean, we've got, we've got a lot of, we've got a lot to get to. Um, we'll go ahead and start with just uh, the big story. And that was, you know, Ivan Melendez, he's headed to the Diamondbacks. Um, you know, congratulations to Ivan, really congratulations to me because <laughs> it is just an unbelievable feeling to cover a player and then, you know, I'm not just like a casual Diamondbacks fan. I'm not going to talk about this story, but I'm like a huge, I watch like 140 games a year. They lose like 132 of them and I'm still watching. <laughs> but to cover Texas baseball for a full year, cover the best hitting season by an individual player that Texas has maybe ever seen. Um, you know, Ivan wins the Golden Spikes. I get really invested in Ivan. And then he goes to the Diamondbacks. That was, you know, the coolest draft moment I've ever had as a fan. So you guys can only imagine my excitement. Um, but most of all, congratulations to Ivan. He really bet on himself after going very late in the draft last year. Makes it all the way up into the second round. He's going to move through that farm system quickly. But um, that is just a really good success story of a guy betting on himself and it, it paying off. Yeah, and I think you're going to see a lot more of this um, in general in the high school ranks and college ranks where guys are going to say, look, I can go make more money. Like, it's cool to draft me in the seventh round, but I'm going to bet on myself. And I'm going to come back better and stronger and, you know, more mature hitter. And um, Ivan did that. I mean, he went from probably around 120 to 150,000 signing bonus to, you know, seven digits. He's, he's going to make a million plus. So yep. yeah, big, big news for him. When he started slipping out of the first round, which I don't, no one expected him to be out of the, you know, in the first round, but the talk had recently been like, watch 31, you know, watch the, um the teams right there at the bottom in the compensatory picks and when the diamonds backs came up i was like oh man this is it like he's gone and sure enough they they took the big time hitter so yeah i don't know who was more excited that day you or ivan i think you showed a lot more emotion <laughs> yeah i was it was a lot because i was like uh, jj puts the former reliever for the diamondbacks he was the one that made the pick so the diamondbacks passed on him at like 34 to take landon sims but then they came back up at 43 and I was just staring at JJ puts. I was like, say Ivan Melendez. I was like, do it, just say it. And then he actually said it. And I just like let out a yell. I like stood up. And then I was like, I, I got a tweet. Like I need to post on orange bloods. And then I was like, wait a second. Like I need to, you know, they're interviewing Ivan. I need to listen to this. Like so much was going on in my head. I was just like on complete overload. And uh, I basically have been ever since, but yeah, I mean, congratulations to Ivan. And then, We'll just, uh, you know, run through the other guys and then we'll circle back and hit on the individual stories there. But Pete Hansen, uh, 97th overall to the Cardinals. Silas Arduan and Douglas Hodo um, both go to the Baltimore Orioles. Um, Arduan went in the fourth round, Hodo in the sixth. The Cincinnati Reds took Trey Faltini in the seventh round. 
And then we had Murphy Staley make it into the 10th round at pick 291 to the Washington Nationals. And then on day three, we had Jared Southard go to the Angels in the 12th and um, Skylar Messenger go in the 19th to the Colorado Rockies. Um, Zach, from that group, anything you really want to point out about those guys? Anything stand out to you? Yeah, you know, I really like the the Pete Hansen pick there in St. Louis. I think he can move through that system pretty quickly. Just he's a location guy. You know, he's not going to overwhelm, but he can certainly come in and do some long relief, especially as the MLB goes to this five starter rotation and you know starts maxing out their starters four or five innings max. Um, I think he could, you know, he could be a kind of an impact guy there in the lower leagues really quickly. Um, at first, I didn't love the fact that Silas went to Baltimore simply because there's a cap, right? You got Adley Rushman there. Yep. But then I started thinking, well, these are the guys that got Adley Rushman ready for stepping up that quickly. And granted, you know, Pete, I mean, uh, Silas and Adley are not the same player by any means. But, you know, Silas is already there defensively. I mean, he's he's ready defensively. And so really, it's it's about them getting him ready for the hitting aspect, which you know, he's never going to be a monster power number guy, but, you know, he can, he can go through that system pretty quickly. I think um, I was honestly a little surprised that Hodo went in the sixth round, but, you know, I think it's actually a sneaky good pick because um, you see the the success that Antico's had and they're very similar players. And the fact that, um, you know, they like to use, utilize their speed. They like to utilize their athleticism in the, on the defensive side. And then they both have a, a good stick. You know, they're very mature at the plate. Um, Faltini fell a little bit further than I thought he would. Um, but, you know, he went to the Cincinnati Reds, who's like his favorite team growing up, which was really cool. I know his mom was posting pictures of uh, of Trey wearing the Reds jersey and a hat and everything like that when he was a little kid. So that was cool. Um, you know, congrats to Staley getting paid 10th round. Like that's that's nothing to shake your head at because he didn't play like other than a couple games last year. I mean, he he was really a bit player, but I know that you know, Neil and the, the family are super stoked for him. That's, that's yeah. really cool. I mean, we talk about Ivan going from, you know, later in the draft all the way up to the second round. Murph went from not getting consistent playing time at Texas to a day two draft pick, which is yeah. even more incredible. So, I mean, huge yeah. congratulations to Murph. I made the joke in uh, my article, but Juan Soto, uh, he, he's getting out of town and he's doing so wisely because he, know, he knows Murph is coming for that job in right field. Yeah, no, Murph, Murph is a great success story. And it's also, you know, stay true to yourself, trust the system, trust the process, you know, grind out and work and good things are going to happen. That's what baseball is. Um, so that was really cool. I didn't love the pick of Southern going to Los Angeles just because they're not known for the best development. But, you know, Southern, he was drafted by the Angels coming out of high school. And so, you know, they obviously, they recognize something within Souther that they think they can really turn him loose and get him going early. Um, you know, if I were them, I would let him focus on his, his fastball as much as he wants, but really work with on developing that slider. Because I think he does have a plus slider hiding in there. It's just location and command at times. And yep. then, uh, yeah, Skyler going to Colorado, the hometown team. That's just that so cool. Awesome. He had a picture of him with uh, Tulo and it was just like, this is this is made like that that's just what dreams are made of for these guys so that was really cool to see yeah we were getting late in day three and you know I had watched you know like 500 picks as had you <laughs> and we were like all right Skyler's like the only one left that we're expecting to get picked here and we we're like when's Skyler gonna get picked like yeah I know like we think he's good like he's he should be able to go here pretty soon and I was getting kind of bummed out that no one was taking him but then he ends up going to the Rockies and I was like all right this was worth the wait because that's just a really cool story. Uh, I'm sure he was ecstatic to be a part of that organization. So those will all be really fun to watch. Uh, congratulations to all of those guys. Um, they were really good at the University of Texas. I mean, you talk about Ivan Melendez, Pete Hansen, Arduan, Hodo, and Faltini. They only really played two full seasons at Texas because of the 2020 COVID year. And they made it to Omaha both of those years. So those five guys were effectively two for two in Omaha, which is really impressive. And then, you know, you've got the other guys, that uh, Murph, Southern, and Messenger, just outstanding Longhorns overall. So we couldn't be happier for those guys. We'll be tracking their stats. We'll be tracking their minor league careers. And, man, yeah, if you, if you think I'm done tweeting about Ivan Melendez, uh, you are sadly mistaken. <laughs> well, and the other thing is you look at Messenger, you know, he played for Kansas for three years. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a guy that, 
you, you talk about taking a chance on yourself. You, you go to a, a program like Texas. I mean, obviously he came in and he was, he was really well known in the big 12. Everyone knew he had talent, but you never know what you're going to run into. I mean, you know, Texas might have someone transfer in or whatever else, but I mean, he took a big bet on himself and um, yeah, it was really cool to see him make that jump. So that was, that was really fun. Yeah, that was really cool. But um, the guys that were on the Longhorns last year were not the only guys that we were paying attention to in this draft, because as we know, um, the high school commits, the high school signees are always at risk to be taken um, in the MLB draft and stolen away from the Texas campus, or maybe some guys that we expect to get picked and they don't, and then they end up do making it to campus. So um, this is all to set up. Let's talk about some of those guys. Um, Zach, you want to run through a couple of the big wins for Texas and then a couple of the losses that maybe Texas wasn't expecting as far as the high school signees? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, obviously the first person actually drafted this year was not even a Texas player. It was a Texas signee and cut a coffee. He went two places ahead of Ivan, but, uh, you know, big time shortstop out of California. He's, he's got big time talent. He's been on the scene for a long time. He's really well known, has a plus glove, super athletic. Um, the thing for him that really boosted his draft stock was that his offense just absolutely exploded this past, uh, this past year. And so when that came around the scouts, he, I mean, he, he was talked about, um, you know, late first round, second round, and he, sure enough, he went 41st overall, but, uh, you know, Cutter Coffee, he would have been an impact player if he had he made it to Texas. He's he's that kind of special talent. And then uh, the other California kid, Henry Bolt, he's been really well known. I mean, he's been on the circuit longer than really any of the signees for Texas. He was at one time one of the top rated kids in his age class, but uh, he's an outfielder. Uh, he's got a special bat. I mean, the guy is just known for just mashing and uh, he's got some swing and miss like they're going to be tweaking with his his approach and his um you know, makeup at the plate, but he got taken in the, in the 56 overall pick. And so, you know, both of them are not, obviously not making it to campus, which, yeah, you know, in talking to Sean Allen before the draft, like they all knew that it was known that, Hey, these guys are yeah, not making thing. it to campus. There's no sweat on these guys. Like yeah. if somehow Henry Bolt fell maybe down to fourth or fifth round. Sure. They had a chance, you know, in talking to some of the coaches that, they felt like there was a 50 50 shot on bolt just because he had a really high signing number. Um, I heard it was two and a half at one point, but you know, he'll, he'll sign for one something. And uh, you know, you, you take the chances. Like I, I, we always hear about the guys like, why are you drafting a guy? You know, is not going to make it. Listen, the guy gets injured or, you know, drafts are weird, really weird places. You know, it's just some things happen and suddenly he falls in your lap and you've got a difference maker and a program changer for three years or two years if they're draft eligible. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, so coffee and bolt, you know, you mentioned it, those were two guys that, you know, no one was really expecting to make it to campus. Um, yeah. Brenner Cox, on the other hand, he goes to the nationals at one eleven. That was a guy that we kind of had our hopes that maybe, you know, this was a possibility he might make it, but um, the nationals kind of took that um, off the board, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, there've been rumors that he, uh, he had, intimated to the MLB scouts that he had better signability than most people thought, you know, because yep. typically a commitment to Texas is pretty strong. Um, the only reason you leave that is because you're, you're going to get a lot of money. Um, but Brenner had made it known that, you know, he had some signability and that the Nats took a guy that, um, you know, I thought, I think everyone expected him to make it to campus. He's a twitchy guy, super athletic, um, he's got a really rangy body that can, you know, as he matures, he's going to hit for a lot more power. Um, he's got gap to gap hitting right now. Um, and he's, he throws as well. I think he's been up to 94. Um, but his future is certainly at the plate, but, uh, yeah, that, that one kind of hurt because he was kind of seen as that next, you know, big time outfielder that Texas going to have roaming out there for three years. So that one was tough, but guess the good news, news is on, yeah. the, on the flip side, um, Jalen Flores, the shortstop out of Brandeis in San Antonio, you know, he had a really high number, but with the two, loss of too low and some things shaking out, it looked like his stock had really, really gone high. And there was talk about him being a second rounder. Well, his, his signing number kept people away and he ends up falling completely out and not getting drafted because he said, you know, I'm, I'm going back. And so um, that, that's a huge addition for Texas. Um, if you think about it, you've had David Hamilton, you threw Faltini, who came in as a pitcher, but had also played shortstop in there. And so you've kind of had this run of just really, really good shortstops, CJ. Um, 
And now you get the next one, which is Jalen Flores. Um, you know, he's really shown an improved bat this summer. He's obviously had a, a good glove all along. He's super athletic. He's a little taller. He's he's what the the guys, you know, like Tulo like. He's a he's about six foot two. So, you know, he may start out at third base. Um, but I mean, I think long, long term, he's a shortstop all the way. And he uh yeah, he brings a lot. He's a very projectable athlete. So not not elite speed but solid runner. Um, he's got really good arm strength. He's really fluid in his swing. Um, so yeah, I, that's a huge pickup for the Texas. I know the coaches are super excited to land him. Yeah. He feels like, he feels like a guy that'll come in and play shortstop, um, right away. It just seems like a natural fit. We had, we'll get to the transfer portal later, but, uh, you know, Tanner Carlson, he'll come in and probably play third. I think it would be reasonable to expect Mitch Daly to battle it out there with Jack O'Dowd at second base. And then Flores yeah. just slides in his short and kind of gets the playing time. We'll see how all that plays out. You know, it's, it's July. So <laughs> yeah. all that could obviously change, but Jalen Flores making it to campus was a big W. And then the other guy that we definitely had our eye on was um, Jared Thomas, the left-handed bat who figures to maybe slide in at first base. I know he can maybe play a little outfield also, but, yeah. He ends up making it to campus, which was another uh, big win for Texas. Yeah, you know, a lot of scouts have him as, uh, you know, the second best pure hitter in North Texas behind Jet Williams. And we saw what Jet Williams did, you know, he yeah. went to the Mets. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Texas Texas fans are going to come to know the name Jared Thomas very quickly. He He's a left-sided hitter, just a pure swing. He has power to all fields, but he doesn't try to do – you know, he really fits what Texas did this year. He doesn't try to do too much with it. You know, he doesn't get under it too much. He's a, he's a contact guy. Um, now, as he grows out that frame, obviously the power is going to continue to develop by for sure. But um, yeah, just, you know, plus runner on the pass. He has the ability to th play first base and outfield, probably stick to the right side. Although right field and dish falk is tricky. Um, but, you know, whenever we talked to Dustin and Drew Bishop, uh, Dustin McComas and Drew Bishop from five tool earlier in the year, you know, one of the sneaky things about Jared Thomas is he might make an impact on the mound as well. You know, he threw two no hitters on his, <laughs> on the, on the way to the playoffs. Casually. Yeah. He, he doesn't have a plus arm by any means, but I mean, he's a left-handed thrower that has some deception. And so, you know, maybe he's the next uh, Brooks Kishnick, who knows, but I mean, the guy, <laughs> you know, he can do both of them. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where they like to slot him in. When I talked to Jared, he said he was willing to do whatever, get him on the field and, you know, help out the team. He's a team first guy. You know, they always talk about the, the top step guy. That's him. He's, he's going to be like that leader guy that comes in. He's a glue guy. Um, so I'm, I, he's probably one of my, I made it known. He's one of my favorite recruits that um, Texas Landon. I think he has a really bright future. So him falling out of the top 10 rounds was, was huge because there was a chance that a team fell in love with that batting potential and, and took him so yeah that'll be interesting uh, to watch especially when you talk about his possible potential on the mound we know there's a lot of innings to replace um, on this Texas pitching staff and no one is really locked into any specific role except for Lucas Gordon probably so there's going to be innings available there's going to be battles to be had throughout the fall so maybe he can be a potential two-way guy for Texas um, yeah and speaking of innings you know the other big potential loss is the Juco right-hander out of uh, McLennan yeah uh john wyatt cheney you know he was expected to eat a lot of innings even potential you know make a run at being a starter um but you know I, I don't know if anyone noticed but silas was the first pick in the in the fourth round by baltimore in the sixth round baltimore did it again and then in the 10th round john wyatt cheney was the first one to come off the it was like texas was like yeah let's just take the texas kid every single round hey, um, you know who noticed that me because yeah. the Diamondbacks <laughs> were picking after the Orioles. And I know I can't complain because the Diamondbacks picked Ivan, but I was like, I texted you. I was like, look, I don't want to press my luck here, but the Diamondbacks are pretty thin at the catcher position throughout the organization. Yeah. So when the fourth round rolled around, I was like, I would not be surprised if the Diamondbacks are eyeing Silas right here. And then he goes to the Orioles one pick before. I was like, ah, <laughs> all right, I can't complain, but oh, well. <laughs> but the thing about John White is, like I said, he – he was definitely going to be seen as a contributor. Now it's, he may come back. Um, 10th round is nothing to sneeze at money wise, but again, does he feel like he can bet on himself, come in, make a big difference at Texas and continue to develop that remains to be seen. But um, 
you know, at this point, I'm not going to count on him, but I think if he'd make it, you'll see a lot of him out of the, out of the bullpen and possibly as a starter. So yeah, I, you know, overall, I'd say that Texas didn't get hit too hard. There weren't too many surprises. And if you look at the, the offset of Flores and Brenner Cox, it really kind of is a neutral draft. I think what kind of tips it into a Texas is a loser is the fact that they did lose John Wyatt because they need arms after last year. So. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that one works out if he ends up making it or if he ends up signing. That'll probably determine how big of a win or a loss it is for yeah. Texas. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of innings and a lot of abs to fill. You want to run through those specific numbers? So I know you uh, you dug those up. <laughs> yeah, so I decided to get a little nerdy the other night, and uh, you ask what I do in my spare time. I look at stats. I look at numbers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I was looking at what you know from a hitting standpoint, a pitching standpoint, what is Texas actually losing with transfers draft? So if you look at the number of total at-bats in a season, Texas is losing 79% of their at-bats from the 2021 season. Uh, from a run standpoint, they're losing 83%. From a hits, also 83%. Home runs are losing 88% of their home runs. I mean, essentially it's Kimball had one daily and then obviously DC. Uh, and then RBIs is even more telling at 85%. So, I mean, if you look at offensive production, you got DC and you got daily coming back and that's about it. I mean, it's, it's going to be a whole new ball game from a, from a standpoint of Texas hitting. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of the transfers. You're going to see a lot of the new, new guys like Jared Thomas or Ryan, Ryland Galvin come in. They're going to have to make some noise early. Um, so it will be exciting to see them this fall. And then if you look at pitching, um, it, the numbers aren't as bad, but then if you look at the names, like just the names alone, you're like, oh man, like what, what do we do here? Because they're, they're losing 62% of their wins, 55% of their appearances, 50% of their starts, and then 58% of their innings pitched. When you combine that with the amount of hitting law, I mean, it's a brand new team. You just lost, essentially, if you, if you say you have 12 stars, 13 stars, you just lost 90% of it overall. Um, you know, thankfully on the pitching side, they got Lucas Gordon coming back. So if you look at your two mainstays on offense, you got DC pitching wise, you got Lucas Gordon, but then pitching wise, you also have Staley. You have Luke Harrison who played a big part as a freshman. You only expect him to begin taking those next steps. Um, but I think that's where like the loss of Southern really hurt was you were, we were expecting him to come back and play a big role. And, um, but he made it known he wanted to take that next step and, you know, power. I'd love to see him on the, on the process. So. Yeah, no, I mean, it'll certainly um, be a lot different. We're going to talk about this in just a second, but Texas wasn't the only team in the big 12 that lost a lot of pieces. I mean, <laughs> they're almost every single team just got completely gutted. So you're just going to see a different conference next year when it comes to the players on the field for just about every team, but um, enough about who Texas has lost. Um, I'm going to run through who has come in from the portal so far. First off, um, Garrett uh, Guillemette, he was a catcher that was at USC. He is now going to be firmly in the mix to compete for a starting job for the Longhorns. He hit 292 at USC, um, solid on defense. Um, Heston Toll, the pitcher from Arkansas, he hasn't pitched that much at Arkansas, but when he did pitch, he had a very good strikeout to walk ratio. He's a good relief arm. He's a righty that he can, he will definitely uh, compete and he'll be an option for David Pierce. Um, Charlie Hurley, I think he's 6'8". Yeah. I believe he is very tall. He's a pitcher from USC. He's coming over um, with Guillemet. And uh, he was a starter last year for USC. He went six and two. Um, he, his ERA was a little bit above four. Um, he's, he's given up some hits over the years. He is, his strikeout to walk ratio isn't ideal, but you get a projectable guy in a six eight frame, put him with a new coaching staff, um, Woody Williams, the new pitching coach, I'm sure. He's not complaining about getting a 6A righty to work with um, right off the bat. So Hurley is a guy that figures to compete for a weekend job, um, maybe a midweek job, but he'll be in the mix to start some games. Uh, like I said, he's very tall. Um, I actually got the scouting report from uh, Guillemet himself. He said he's got a, a nasty spike curve ball, so I'm looking forward to seeing that in person. And then uh, the other big one was just recently, Texas got Tanner Carlson, the brother of Dylan Carlson, the um, star player for the Cardinals. We got Tanner from Long Beach State. Um, he's a career 290 hitter, but he's coming off a 345 season um, in 39 games at third base for Long Beach State. 
So he doesn't hit a bunch of home runs, but he's a guy that's going to get on base. We know the Texas offense is just going to look different this year. Maybe it'll be more of a old school Texas offense, getting guys on base, moving them around, running around. So um, it's like I said, it's July, but I could picture Carlson and DC right at the top of the lineup, just getting on base. And then uh, David Shaw, the pitcher from Rice, we'll see what they can get out of him. He struggled at Rice a bit last year, but um, he's got some potential as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, thoughts on those guys, Zach, what jumps out to you? And then uh, I'll let you do the whole Skeens thing, but that's just, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing you like about Garrett from USC is the fact that, you know, he played in what 50 games and 48 games over the past two seasons. So he's got a lot of experience catching, which, yeah. you know, defensively that, that was kind of, you know, Silas is, he was the best defensive catcher and Kimball has always been no more of a, a kind of a bat first guy. Um, but, you know, Garrett's showing some good pop this summer out in the Cape. He's playing for the, the Orlean Firebirds. Um, you know, there's some great videos of him hitting out there. He's, he's actually a guy that funny enough hits more, for extra bases than he does singles. Um, like if you look at spray chart, which I love the fact that the Cape has spray charts and all that, like yeah. you said, you nerd out on that kind of stuff, but uh, you know, he's, he's very much like Silas that he's hit. He likes hitting it up the middle. He likes hitting it just to the left of the um, second base. And so I think he's a guy that's going to step in and I, I would, if I had to bet money on it right now, I bet he's the starter come day one. Obviously Kimball is going to give him a run for his money and Ryland Galvin will give him a money, but, um, I could see Garrett starting day one. You know, Heston Toll is a guy that had a really strong freshman campaign for Arkansas. He he started off a little slow in the sophomore campaign and just didn't get to, you know, the playing time he wanted. But he's a guy that he's not going to overwhelm you with that fastball, but he's got a really wicked um, off-speed pitch. And yep. then his uh, changeups are really good. And so, you know, he's a guy that has a really high strikeout to walk ratio. And one of the things you saw last year with Texas, they could not throw strikes. And so, you know, he's definitely an intriguing guy. He's also a taller kid. Um, so I, I think they'll look to him pretty often and early on, kind of the way that you saw um, some of the guys that, you know, Pierce really likes to lock in on a guy and just, you know, in a group and focus on them. I think he'll yeah. be one of those guys. Like that how uh, lock in Staley early was in used pretty much. Travis Staley uh, early in the year. He you was know, Charlie Hurley. Hurley. Like you said, his ERA was north of four his first two seasons. Um, but he did go 16, uh, six and two over 13 starts last year. So, you know, he has that experience. And he's also, he's, you know, he's been used to Garrett. So those two are going to have a connection right away and calling pitches and receiving. Um, Carlson, I think, is a guy that comes in and, you know, he's going to be at the top of the lineup. He doesn't hit a lot of home runs. As you said, he's not a power guy. But he's a solid fielder at 985. He's he gets on base just under 400 OPA or a uh, on base percentage. Um, so yeah, I could see him, you know, at that number two or you know, maybe even a leadoff spot for Texas next season. Um, I certainly think he sticks at third base unless Flores just kind of kicks him out. But he looks like a third baseman all the way. And then David Shaw is an interesting one. You know, he made his freshman start or not start, but uh, appearance against Texas in Austin last season for rice and he was a bullpen guy throughout the entire season until the end uh, when i talked to shaw he said his changeup had really come a long way and he had about two ticks on his velo he's also a kid i think he's six 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 seven i mean talk about it you know just a big tall imposing kid yeah so you always worry about repeatability but i think his uh his era is a little overblown rice wasn't that great you have a freshman coming in learning things so he's a kid that um you know off season playing out in uh he's playing with uh the Forrester Santa Barbara with Campbell and a couple other guys I think that's really good for him to see you know that kind of next tier of of hitting and you know hopefully he can come make a jump and who knows he might push for a starter a Tuesday night role so we'll see yeah no I mean there's definitely going to be a lot of competition in the fall um I know it's important to have those roles solidified when it comes to spring but there will be a lot determined in the fall there will be a lot determined early in the spring when it comes to yeah who's going to be in what role on this pitching staff, but the transfers will definitely um, play a big part in that. Um, Zach, next week on our show, we are going to go into detail about the 2022 class with the special guests that we will have joining us, but I will let you just run through and um, list the guys that we, that Texas will have on campus next year. Um, just a lot of new faces coming in. Yeah. And, and before we get to that, you, you'd mentioned the air force transfer. Uh, oh yes, Keith, Yeah. 
yeah, unfortunately and sadly for Texas fans, it's not going to happen. Uh, the loss of Tulo and um, just the connections he has to a couple other programs, you know, he's headed to the SEC. Uh, he'll be there for one year. It's Mississippi State, Vanderbilt, LSU, Arkansas. I would say the most likely ending up spot is going to be Arkansas or Mississippi State the way it looks right now. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, he he would have been day one instant starter, just massive upgrade. But, um, yeah, it's just wasn't in the cards for Texas, unfortunately. So we got to see him. Well, I guess what we will, uh, you know, we would have seen him again this uh, in 2023 season, but he transferred away from Air Force. So. There you go. There's your scouting report for those guys. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, but you're talking about the 2022 class. Yeah, so you got shortstop third baseman Jalen Flores. Um, you have the the do it all man Jared Thomas. Like I said, first base, right field, left handed pitcher. We don't know. He might do all three. Uh, you got right fielder Max Ballou. He's one of the top hitters in the state of Texas. He's got a big bat on him. Uh, the catcher Rylan Galvin. Uh, you know. I think he's a really special talent. And if it weren't for Garrett coming in, I think he would be pushing Kimball very hard because Ryland has an outstanding bat. Uh, you got right-handed pitcher, Max Grubbs. He's got a really good fastball. I think you're going to see him early and often, kind of the way they saw Staley early and often. Um, so they actually flipped a commitment from Texas Tech. He's a shortstop, maybe most likely second base, Kate O'Hara. Don't know how much we're going to see him, but he's known for his bat. Uh, they picked up a recent right-hander, Kobe Minchie. He's a he's actually a homeschool kid, but he he went took his fastball this offseason from 88 to about 94. So he's a hard thrower. We'll talk about him more next week, but he's a guy that could come and make some noise out of the bullpen. Uh, you got Duplantier's little brother, Jalen. He's kind of shortstop. He's coming in. Uh, you got left-handed pitcher Chris Stewart out of uh, San Jacinto. Uh, I still think he's going to end up being one of the starters, probably Sunday starter for Texas, big time arm. You have his teammate, right-handed pitcher, DJ Burke, also from San Jack. He's a bullpen guy. He sits 94, 95. The thing about Chris Stewart and DJ Burke, you got to love is the fact that Woody Williams is coming from San Jack and is very intimately familiar with those guys. So it helps a lot. Yeah. He's going to trust his guys that he knows right off the bat. So I think you'll see a lot of both of them. Uh, you got the left-hander, Colin Valentine. You know, he's probably a, a season or two away, but he's got one of those frames, one of those arms that as he matures and grows, he could be an absolute monster. Uh, you got catcher Grant Farlander. He's a walk-on, but, you know, solid, solid bat out of St. Michael's. And then the right-hander, Peter George. I talked to his dad, Derek, not long ago, and, you know, he's he's been hitting 97, 98 off the bump and sitting 94 comfortably. The thing about Pierce has always been his command, so we'll see what that looks like. Maybe he might need a season, but, uh, you know, anytime you get a guy that's throwing 98, 97, sure. Come on down. Like, let's make a, let's make a show of it. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm excited to talk more about each of those guys next week and then uh, eventually watch them in the fall and then watch them in the spring next year, see what kind of impact they can make um, as Longhorns yeah. throughout their career. Um, let's go big picture here and talk about the big 12. Uh, we spent some time yesterday going through and just looking at what each team lost graduation wise to the draft, maybe the transfer portal. And um, yeah, like we said, Texas was not the only team to take some losses this off season. Baylor, they lost five of their top six hitters. They lost their top two starting pitchers, Kansas. This one hurts because they were last place. They didn't even make the <laughs> conference tournament. And then they lose nine of their top 10 hitters in the entire weekend rotation. So I'm not, um, I'm yeah. not expecting much from the Jayhawks next year personally. You know. and, and they had a coaching change. So it's like all of their transfers that you saw Maui Huna go to Tennessee. You saw Tavion go to Arkansas. You're like, what, what world? I mean, I don't even know what Kansas is going to do next season, to be honest. I, you know, they must be like throwing out pink slips. Like, Hey, we got jobs open. We got jobs open. Yeah. I was just thinking like, you know, in pro sports, they talk about having a title window of like, Oh, the roster stacked. The roster's probably never going to be that good. I think last year might have been Kansas's title window and they just did not make the most of it Um, because I that might be the best roster they have, even though it might not have seemed like it. But I think uh, things might be headed downhill there in Lawrence. But, um, you know, we'll see. Uh, Kansas State lost um, their two hot, their two top hitters and their two top pitchers. Oklahoma, they lost quite a bit. Um, We saw Peyton Graham slide a little bit in the draft. I was pretty surprised about that. Um, Kate Horton. He did not slide. He went from being a bullpen guy for Oklahoma and then 
we saw him in the Big 12 tournament, what he did, and then we saw what he did in the regional, and then the super regional, and then twice in Omaha, and then you look up and he's going seventh overall in the MLB draft. So that was quite the rise there for uh, Cade Horton. But Oklahoma, they lost four really good hitters. They lost uh, three pitchers. Um, I'll let you take over with Oklahoma State um, and just run through the rest of the teams. Yeah, and, you know, the other thing about Oklahoma is it, it wasn't just, like, the four best hitters they lost. They also lost three of their solid contributors. I mean, yep. if you look at their roster, they just got hammered by the draft, which, you know, great for Skip Johnson. Love it. You know, Clay yep. Van Hook turned it into a head coaching job at UTA. Um, Oklahoma's promoted Reggie Willis to associate head coach to take over Clay's job. But, yeah, I mean, Oklahoma's going to – you know, they talk about the 2020 season was Skip's best team on paper. You know, he had the pitching staff and, um, you know, this year by far exceeded expectations, making to the Caldwell series and then playing for a title, obviously. But, um, yeah, I'm sure Skip's kind of got his pencil out going, wait, who are all these guys? Like, I don't, I don't recognize any of you sons. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Oklahoma state, obviously they lost their best hitter in Jake Thompson, just graduation, but they also lost the the Norseman Griffin Dorshing. So we're never going to see another 550,000 foot home run from that guy again. Yeah, Jesus. Fine by me. Um, but they, you know, they lost several starters on offense, but they still have rock Riggio. They still have a lot of really solid pieces. I think offensively Oklahoma state's probably your, you know, comes out the, the best positioned offensively, but then you look at their pitching staff <laughs> Everyone got, got thinking, taken. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, they lost all three of their starting rotation. Then they lost Roman. They lost Trevor Martin. I mean, you go down the list, they lost six of their top contributors, and you're like, it's a whole new pitching staff on their side. TCU loses Tommy Sacco from their shortstop. But then they lose, and you're like, offensively, okay, they're fine. But then they lose their entire weekend rotation and they're they're you know their best bullpen guy. Um Texas obviously lost their top six of their eight uh, hitters, but they lost eight starters in total. I mean, Texas and Oklahoma's right there for playing where's Waldo of who the heck is, you know, like wear name badges in the fall. Cause no one's going to know who you are. Um, Texas tech lost their best player in Jace young. I mean, rest in peace to the young family, finally getting out of the big 12. Hopefully there's not, you know, a, a little cousin or something out there that was going to torment us in the next four years. Um, but they lost three starters as well. I mean, but they also are returning Hudson White, who's absolutely been killing it. They got um, Brazil. They got Gavin Cash, the transfer from Texas. So I think offensively, it's, it's pretty silly to doubt Tadlock's offensive acumen. But then you look at the pitching side and kind of like Oklahoma State, they lost everyone. I mean, they lost they lost their entire weekend rotation. They lost several of their, st um, their stud relievers. Now, granted, everyone complained about their pitching this season but that doesn't automatically mean the incoming guys are going to be better automatically. So yep. there's always that, that progression. Right. Um, and then West Virginia was kind of a, a smitter smatter of, they lost their two starters, probably one of their best outfielders. They lost two of their contributors who were very solid offensively. They lost their top. And one of the starters was their, uh, their star catcher who went to Florida state. Um, but then they lose Waters, who was like the all-time relief dude, then moved into starting role. They lost Braithwaite, who was also tormented Texas. So, yeah, I, you know, the summary is that Kansas and Baylor are probably going to be pretty bad. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what they have coming in. I know, well, I, I should say, I know, shout out to Danny Val Valadez. I know he's a right-handed pitcher out of Cedar Ridge for Baylor. Like, I expect him to see a lot of innings. Um Kansas I tried to look through some of the Juco stuff like they lost a Juco guy to the draft you're just like you you can't buy like this bad luck I mean ouch um yeah the, the thing that the thing that really stood out was the pitching from the Big 12 that we're losing it's it's all gone like there's Lucas Gordon might be the best remaining pitcher out there coming back like that's it's crazy no it's incredible I was really looking through it and I was thinking if you know, coaching and pitching is obviously super important, but maybe this upcoming year, more than any other year in the past, the way the pitching coaches throughout the conference are going to be asked to develop and get either transfers or freshmen or just guys that haven't pitched a lot to step into immediate roles, that's probably going to determine, you know, what happens in this conference. And I know it might be easy to say, oh, yeah, well, duh, you know, whoever has pitches the best is going to do really well. But this is just a unique scenario where it's not, you're trying to get your returning guys to come in and pitch well and, you know, keep the momentum rolling with like a, 
Pete Hansen or a Jake Bennett or a Tyler Thomas. This is yes. going to be, I'm getting brand new guys from the portals. I'm putting them in a new pitching program. I'm getting a freshman that's been dominating high school kids. And now I'm throwing them in the big 12. What can I get out of them? So it's going to be, it's going to be up to Woody Williams um, and the Texas coaching staff. It's going to be up to all the other pitching coaches and coaching staffs around the big 12, because we are going to see a lot of new faces on the mound. And that's obviously going to play a big part into how next year works out. But yeah, it was just yeah. incredible to watch the draft and just see big 12 guy after big 12 guy. Um, but yeah, 40, 47 kids taken out of the big 12 active players, which is the most for the big 12 conference in the, in the 20 round era, obviously when they were doing 40,000 rounds, you know, there was a thousand kids taking, it was higher, but you know, the other thing that to keep in mind is it's not just Texas that has a new staff in place. TCU, yep. same exact situation, you know, um, Masilio gets the head coaching position at Ohio state. He hires Sean Allen to come in. Uh, Rice has a, or not Rice, uh, Kansas has a brand new pitching staff and uh, coaching staff in general. Baylor, obviously they have a new coaching staff because coach Rodriguez is now at Texas. So you've got four big programs um, across, or, you know, four programs across the board that are all going to have major coaching changes. Um, so that obviously takes, you know, sometimes you get positive, sometimes you get negatives. It's, it's going to be a different look completely. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, we're going to have a lot of content leading up to the season, obviously. Um, we're going to post this to the board. Like we've said many times, we're going to have a new episode of Around the Horns next week. Um, Zach is going to have an article coming out that is basically be like this video written version, uh, maybe more details, some other stuff, some winners and losers from the MLB draft um, across the country. So he's got a lot coming out. Um, we've got plenty of baseball going on. Uh, Orange Bloods over there. Um, the portal is not done yet. You know, we could still see some more guys coming through yeah. the portal. So yeah, grad uh, transfers, you got kids that are still in the portal that can still commit at any time. You know, yep. Texas has a kid coming in this weekend, apparently that um, is a potential big time arm. So yeah, there's, there's lots of movement still on the incoming side as well. Yeah, no doubt. So for that reason, um, please check us out on orangebloods.com. Um, subscribe to this YouTube page. You can like this video, leave some comments. Um, share it with all your Texas baseball loving friends and uh, Zach, unless you got anything else, I think we're about ready to get out of here. Let's uh, let's hit the road. All right, let's do it. So uh, hook them until next time. Until next time, hook them.